Good morning, Trinity family. Good morning, Trinity E Church and Facebook Live family. And welcome to our Sunday morning service here on August the 23rd. It is so good to have you in the house online, or if you're watching this later on on demand, it is a blessing to be able to share and worship with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. For those who are tuning in online, let me just give you a little bit of background information. Trinity Baptist Community Church International is located at 5918 South Illinois Route 31 in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Our worship, our normal worship times are from 10 to 11 is our adult Bible study. And from 11 to 12, during this uh, pandemic time frame, we call it the Trinity Hour, is our worship experience at, on site at Trinity Baptist Community Church and online Central Standard Time. If you're tuning in with us online, uh, there are a number of, different, number of different platforms that the Lord has blessed us to be able to use. Uh, Facebook Live, Trinity Baptist Community Church, you can tune right in and be a part of our experience. And if you're do, tuning in on Facebook Live, uh, then I want to invite you to click on your share button right now and start a watch party and invite your friends, neighbors, and all your, all your guests on that listing to join us for this experience. If you're tuning into our website, trinitybcci.org, uh, you, you get an immediate, the direct experience of, on, of, a, of online also worship with us live, and we're just happy to have you to join in during that time. Uh, Periscope is one of our other platforms. We're thankful that you may tune in using that platform. And you can also catch this, uh, this broadcast on demand on YouTube and YouTube Live and on uh, the cable systems immediately afterwards. So we thank you for taking the time to tune in with us. It's a beautiful Sunday morning that the Lord has blessed us with, and we want to be able to open up our time and sharing with you. And if, you, if, you're, if you're tuning in with us or watching us during the week, let me not pass by too quickly without mentioning that we, we offer our Daily Bread devotionals on Facebook each and every morning uh, for your experience, for your worship experience. And it will, it's a great way to start your day off by getting some word into your system and meditating on that word and kicking off your day. It's a Daily Bread uh, devotionals that we send out each and every morning. And on Wednesdays, we have our midweek uh, devotional and teachable moments with Bishop Love during the noon hour. It's a live broadcast that's then later, for, later available to you for replay. And we're praying that you'll take advantage of that. Whatever vehicle that you're joining with us on, we're thankful that you're taking this time to be a part of our worship experience. And if you're in the area, come on down and join us. We're open and live, and we'd love to be able to worship with you uh, live on Sunday mornings. So without further ado, I want to turn this over to our First Lady, Dr. Karen Love, to begin opening up our worship experience. May God bless you and enjoy the time as we worship together as family and friends. Amen. God is good. And he's worthy. Aren't you glad? Me too, although I'm dropping. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like the situations were too hard, that God wasn't listening, that there was so much pain you're going through, the midnight hour, and you ask, God, do you hear me? Do you love me? Am I still a part of your heart? You see darkness, you experience darkness, and say, God, where are you? Well, in Genesis chapter 18, verses 14 and 15, when God promised Abraham a son, Isaac, and God asked the question, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And then the Bible, when we read it, it says, Sarah laughed, but then she denied it and said, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And then God says, no, but you did laugh. And in our interpretation, we think Sarah mocked God. But when I went to the Hebrew interpretation, which was fabulous and wonderful, uh, the word hard means wonderful or marvelous. And the thing means words ex or expression of the heart. So let me ask you these questions. Is anything that comes from the heart of God too wonderful or marvelous? Or in the declarative, there is nothing more wonderful than the expression from the heart of God. 
And then in terms of Sarah denying or, or mocking God, laughter would suggest humility or submission to God, joining with God, a new beginning with God. She laughed. But in her culture, she was afraid, and she denied it. So let me ask you today, is anything more wonderful than a promise or a word from God? And so I love that today. So when we come together and we worship today, and we're asking Lord to, Lord, prepare us to be a sanctuary. Because we want to worship you the way you, you desire to be worshipped. And we want to bless you the way you desire to be blessed. We want to grieve the way you desire us to grieve. So God, prepare us to be a living sanctuary. Because there is nothing more wonderful than the expression from the heart of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so the song I'm singing this morning, and it's, it's basically a, a call and response. I want you to join me. Um, it's called, Lord, Prepare Me to Be a Sanctuary. Okay? And if we can get some music. There you go. Please stand. Pure and holy, tried and true. Prepare me to be a sanctuary.
worship God today, for he is a sovereign God. He's a mighty God. We love him and we praise him day in and day out. God, you're an awesome God, and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Deacon John Pickens will come and lead us with the scripture and the morning prayer. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to read for you from the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, verses 1 through 8. It's a particular scripture that I've meditated on since I was a child. And the book of Ecclesiastes, third chapter. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Ecclesiastes, third chapter, verses one through eight. I'm going to pray. Let us bow our heads. Our Father, we come lifting you up on this very special day just to lend these some thanks for the many things that you've done for us. We come thanking you for a place that we can come to worship your name. We come thanking you, Master, for keeping us intact. We have not fallen by the wayside. Thank you, Master, for our homes. Thank you for our beds. Thank you for transportation. Thank you for keeping us in our right mind. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. We just come here to lift you up, Master, because we are just a few of your believers that believe in your power. We believe that you are the reason that we're here, and we just come asking you to bless us. Thank you, Master, as we lift you up in song, as we lift you up with your word, as we lift you up with dance. Thank you, Master. We're thanking you ahead of time because you blessed us before we even got here, Master. And we come lifting you up right now. Thank you, you Master, in the middle of a pandemic that we can still come out and lift up your holy name. Thank you, Master, for our homes. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our neighbors. Thank you for our fellow Christians that are praying for us. Thank you, Master. I praise you most of all for my home, Master. It's not one that I built. It's not one that I was worthy of. I just thank you and lift up your holy name. Thank you, Master, for looking in on us. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come back out here on a Sunday morning and praise your name. Thank you for the many things that you've done. You've dispensed the spirit of education among this church. And we just thank you, Master. Thank you for the young ones. Thank you for keeping us intact in the middle of the confusion. Thank you for your blessings in our home. Thank you for the sick, Master, because it could have been us. But thank you that you've kept us together and we're talking to each other, we're praying for each other, we're trying to lift each other up. 
thank you, O oh Lord, for looking in on us. Thank you for blessing our church. Thank you for our pastor, his wife, and the family. Thank you for keeping them intact. Thank you for shoring them up in the areas they may not be so strong in. Thank you, Master, for keeping the church intact. And we lift up your holy name. Thank you for our media team. Without it, we don't know where we would be. We'd just be praising you here all by ourselves. But thank you that you broadcast your word, Master. Thank you for all the good things that you've done. Thank you for watching over us individually, Master, in our homes, our relatives, our loved ones, our children. Thank you, Master. I even thank you for our neighbors. Some of them may not come, but thank you that you blessed us to be able to come here and lift up your name and praise your name for them. Thank you. We just lift up your holy name today. It's a special day that we set aside for praising your name and worshiping you. We know you. We know that you're not human and we should praise you in spirit. And we're here to praise you in spirit and tell our neighbors about the good things that you've done for us. Thank you, Master, that you brought us just a little further. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray and for his sakes. Amen.
Jesus. Oh, he'll do it if you let him. Come on, church family, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. Thank you, daughter. For leading us in praise and the worship. Uh, if you turn with me in your Bibles on this precious Sunday morning that the Lord has blessed us with to Philippians, chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number two. This is it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. We all are. We we're good. We're going to focus our attention today on verses 12 through 16 with a key verse for our reading together of verse number 15. So Philippians chapter two, verses 12 through 16, key verse number 15. 15. You locate that in your Bibles. If you don't mind standing with me, give me an amen. We're all together. We're all together. Amen. Let's read this one verse and set some tone for our time together. Philippians chapter 2, verses, verse number 15. Let's read together. It says, That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Oh, let's do that one more time. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. As you take your seats, you want to focus our attention on that close, the closure of that verse, shining as lights for Christ. Shining as lights for Christ. Now, just a little bit of context, because it's always important when you begin, when you're in the process of, uh, of uh, interpreting the Word of God, to make sure that you have some sense of the context that's taking place that the writer is writing to you about, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So here you have Paul. Oh, yeah. We've done series in, in Philippians over the over the decades we've been together, but here you have the Apostle Paul, who's been converted, uh, who's been knocked off his horse, who's been changed, transformed. And now in, his, in the latter stages of his ministry, his apostolic ministry, finds himself in the very place that he longed to be, location that would be Rome, but under, not under the circumstances or situations that he imagined that he would be. And so he finds himself under house arrest. He's been shipped off to Rome and He's facing charges, <clears throat> and he knows in the midst of that he's uh, under, the, under the headship, under the guise of, a, of an emperor who, who is very much anti these so-called Christians, these people of the way, and wouldn't hesitate uh, to crucify them, to persecute them, to take their very life. Uh, he's done it before. He will do it in the future. And so Paul finds himself chained to a Roman guard that, the historians tell us, uh, around the clock. So they would take shifts. I believe it was four-hour shifts, we were told, that the guard would come in. And uh, there, under house arrest, he would be chained to him. And Paul saw this not as a, as a necessary hardship, but as an opportunity to be able to witness the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ to the very small audience that God had placed in front of him. So they talk about how Paul had won those, many of those guards to Christ and how that word had begun to spread into Rome because they had seen his witness and had heard his testimony and his, how he had shared the word of God with them. And they had taken it to heart and had been transformed individuals themselves. And now in the process had gone out into this pagan land called Rome and had begun to share with their neighbors and their loved ones and their friends and their co-workers 
about how good Jesus Christ was. In the midst of that, Paul um, is writing to this church because he also hears that there are some things going on he needs to address. Uh, he writes this, this epistle, this, this letter, with a strong theme throughout the letter about how do you have joy in the midst of your circumstances in life. Uh, how, how do you maintain a Christ-like intrinsic joy that the world didn't give you and the world cannot take away, even when everything around you is telling you that you ought to be disgruntled and fearful and anxious and uh, worried about all of life's circumstances, about life itself. And so Paul writes out, and in these few short verses, I just want to pick up on his theme. Two life lessons I want to share. The first is, before I get to that first one, hold on to it. He, he's, he, he's, he, he buckets this little grouping of scriptures under three kind of categories, for lack of a better way. Can I just talk to you as family today? He, he talks about the importance of, of, of individual uh, testimony and service. He puts it on us personally when he talks about it. Then he talks about the importance of uh, us as a church body and how we interact and relate one to another. And then he steps on the third, on the third level. He talks about how we, not only individually, but, but in a corporate church body fashion, how we ought to interact and impact the world that we live in. Those three things is what Paul's getting at in these few short verses. Let's dive right in, if you don't mind. Let's dive right in. Opens up with verse number 12. The King James, I believe, uh, is up on the screen. And I'm, I'm going to read you the Amplified. Uh, it says, therefore, my dear ones, as you have already obeyed my suggestions, so now not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out, out to the gold, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, that self-disgust with, with serious caution and tenderness of conscience in the parentheses it says, watchfulness against temptation, timidity, shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of, of him. Work, work it out with, with, with reverence and awe and trembling. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. Oh, I need you to be praying on this. Parentheses, it says, energizing and creating in you the power and desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Now, that's a mouthful. Let me give you the first life lesson. I'll give you a little takeaway, if you don't mind. The fundamentals of a Christ-like life include a transformational belief in and relationship with Jesus. Second, a renewed mind and character that is in fellowship with Christ. And thirdly, an enlarged heart to share and to serve for Christ. I know, I, get, I know I wrote a lot up there. I wrote a lot up there. Let me say it twice for the audience that's listening out there and, and online. The fundamentals of a Christ-like life include a transformational belief in and relationship with Jesus Christ, a renewed mind and character in fellowship with Christ. That means walk with him, walk with him. An enlarged heart to share and serve for Christ. Did, did you hear what he said as he opens up his epistle here? Now, this is on the, this is on the back end of of him talking about how important it is for us to be in one accord, how important it is for us to be, have an attitude and purpose and a mind that is like Jesus Christ, that, I almost need to read it, that, that, that being made of no reputation, who being in the form of God, verse 6 says, I didn't ask you for this, but being in the form of God, 6 says, thought, not it, ro thought it not robbery to be with God. He says, have that kind of mind in you, but made of himself no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. You're not exalting yourself. God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every single name, that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He says, let that mind be in you. Now let that mind be in you. How does that mind get into you? How, how do you get that mind of Christ that allows you to have that kind of humility, that kind of power, that kind of joy, that kind of expectation and exaltation that comes from God the mighty? It comes first and foremost from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that transforms the old man. As Paul would later say, you have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things have become new. And when, that, when they become new, then, then God has worked that salvation in you. You have been set apart for his glory. You have been saved and justified and made right in great standing in the eyes of God, a legalistic term. You have been made right in the eyes of God. You have been this position for glory and for heaven. And you are a child and daughter. You are a son and daughter of the King Most High. He said that's the salvation that God has worked in you, which now changes not only your who-ness, but it changes your whose-ness. Hmm? So I can't get to where I'm working out something that has not been worked in me. If I try to live out a life, if I try to change my behavior, uh, modify my behavior in my own strength and will, then the fallen man tends to show up and show out in ways that he, he has no business doing. You know, only God can begin the pos that transformative process that begins to move us to be more like Christ Jesus. And if impacts our attitude, which impacts our actions, which impacts our, our behavior beyond, which impacts our pattern of life, which impacts the legacy that we, that we set out before us. So that if you want to change your legacy, your direction, your, your results, and you got to get back into how you change your actions. And if you can't want to change your actions, you got to change your attitude. And he says, let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he gives us the encouragement. He says, work it out. He says, it's not that thing which God has worked in you. Work, work it out. Exercise it. In other words, there's, a, there's in your new creation statehood, in your newness in Christ Jesus, God has given you not only his power and his presence, the Holy Spirit living in you, he's equipped you with giftings that enable you to accomplish the purpose that he has birthed you and designed you for. He said, discover that, walk in that, and let that fruit and bear fruit for Christ through that. So it's a transformational belief and relationship with Christ. It is a renewed mind and character as you walk with and in fellowship with Christ. You, you know how that is, church. I, I don't want to just preach this thing at you. you. You know how it is. As you continue to grow in Christ, you spend time with the Lord in his word. And you, on so, every, every day when you get up, spend a few moments there. Let that feed you. Let that nourish you. Let that indeed enrich you and enliven you and empower you to do what God has done, it, it, you will grow more to be like Christ as you spend time in prayer and in study with him. And then you begin to apply that thing. It's not just spending time in study. It's more than an intellectual exercise. It's now how do I take those principles, that change that I've learned, that transformation that has happened to me, and how do I put it out on the street? How do I impact my journey? How do I work it out of me? How do I live it out inside of me? So it's more than just a transform spirit and mindset and belief system, it's now the renewing of my character and my mind. Things are changing. You wonder sometimes, well, now, what happened to that old taste I used to have to do stuff I used to do? Somehow the Lord has captured that and changed that. I, 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 I may still have the temptation, but I don't run towards it like I used to. I didn't think my mindset wasn't set like it was. He says, work that thing out. Work it out. And work it out with reverence to God, with, with, a, with a, a, a tenderness of your consciousness, with a watchfulness against temptation, the text tells, with a, a shrinking away from what might offend God and discredit his name. He said, walk, work that thing out as the new creature in Christ. Because God has worked it in you. And he's worked it in you so that you can have impact, that enlarged heart that he's given you, that transformed mind and character that's given you, that new man or woman that you are, so that you can have impact personally on whatever setting or people 
Lord, the sword sends across your path. So first and foremost, he said, the fundamentals are it starts with you. It's an individual thing. He said, I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about you as the church. You as the church. You and me. He said, start, start at home. Work it out in your individual life and attitude. And then he begins to, he begins to step all into our business in these next few verses here. He, 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 after stepping into us individually, he begins to talk about us relationally. 14 says, do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God and questioning and doubting among yourselves. 15 says, that you may show yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated children of God without blemish, faultless and irrebukable, the, in parentheses it says, in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation that is spiritually perverted and perverse, among whom you are seen as bright lights, stars or beacons shining out clearly in this dark world and holding out and offering to all men the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may have something which, of which exultingly to rejoice and glory, and that I did not run my race in vain, Paul says, and spend my labor at no purpose. Here it feels like to me that Paul is kind of reflecting back on a little bit of his journey. Let me give you the second life lesson before we... We go into his background. The impact, the impact of a Christ reflective life includes a Christ centered love, humility, and unity. Christ centered. An authentic, emboldened, and grace filled lifestyle and journey. Let me live it out. A Bible centered steadfast and joy-filled perspective on life. In other words, we want, our, we want our interpretation of life and our application to life to be not self-centered, not world-centered, but Bible-centered. Oh, I need to get there. When I get there, I might have to stay for a minute. Because this is, this is where you get, this is where things start to get transformed in your walk. It really is. Paul has now gone from his own journey. And as I, be, as I think about this and think on his walk, it feels like Paul is reflecting it. It feels to me like he's, he, he, he's, he's thinking back even over his experience and that's recorded in Acts 16 in, in Philippi, where he, he's being challenged. He's being challenged by this soothsayer. He, he says, I got to live this out in front. He says, my experience is that Christ, the Lord gives me the strength and the wisdom to live out the life that the new life he's placed inside of me, in the presence, first and foremost, of the people that I congregate with, and then in the world setting that is perverse and crooked and morally corrupt. And, 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 and the first piece of that is don't let, don't let your self-centeredness, don't let our self-righteousness, don't let our self-glorification get in the way of the relationships that God has placed us in. He's talking to the church. <laughs> Paul is talking to the church in Philippi. He says, I know you got issues down there. I know we got Gentiles who have beliefs on one side coming together with Jews who have beliefs on the other side. You got cultural distinctives. You got ethnic di divisions. You got all kinds of stuff that you brung to the table. And now you're in, but now you are new creatures in Christ Jesus, in which the Bible is trying to tell you there's no Greek or Jew, there's no male or female. None of that's significant or important spiritually in the body of Christ. We're all, the ground is all leveled at the cross, and we're all of one blood. And he's trying to to tell us you got to if you're spending time wasting your time grumbling and murmuring and complaining about something you're wasting valuable energy and time that God could be using to have a powerful difference relationally he said cut that mess out I'm, I'm preaching to the camera now he said church ch churches cut, cut, <laughs> cut that mess out there's no place for that you, you you got too much great stuff to give. And it, 
What, does, what happens when you get in it? I don't hear anything unifying or positive about this one. It, it, it just zaps your joy energy, doesn't it? Huh? Like life is, a, is entirely, you see, when you live a little bit, you learn that life is entirely too short to be spending a whole lot of time and energy on a whole bunch of mess. <laughs> I'd love to say from day one that we want to keep the, the Lord's house a drama-free zone. That's been my saying from day one, almost 30 years now. Now, since, we, since we're drama-filled individuals, that's probably an impossibility, but the reality is that in this house, the soil that the Lord is planting here, you may try to bring the seed of drama to it, but it has no nourishment. It, can't, it ain't going to grow here. It just ain't going to grow here. I'm going to help somebody. Let me talk to the camera. It, it, it ain't going to grow here. You can bring it in and try to plant it in here. You can try to stir it up in here, but it ain't going to grow in here. One or two things are going to happen. You're going to be transformed when you come in here, or you're going to be transported someplace else. You ain't going to stay here doing that stuff. Now, let me give you the reality. <laughs> Y'all going to make me preach while I leave. Paul makes it powerfully plain. He makes it powerfully plain. He makes it powerfully plain. Do all the stuff that we do, everything that God has placed on you, this working out of your salvation, this working out of your new character, this working out of your new spiritual giftedness, this working out of your new anointing that the Lord has placed on you, this working out of this new joy, this new, this new ability to stand firm in the midst of your circumstances. Work, as you're working that out, do that with a joy-filled heart and not with one that's fault-finding or complaining against God or, or questioning or doubting among yourselves. He said, there's no place for that. He said, and, and then the adverse is, the, the contrast is, show yourselves to be blameless and godless. <laughs> he said, you got to change, you got to change this, you got to change our attitude. Let the Holy Spirit change your attitude. He's working in you to work it out of you. And he wants you to be, un, the, tech, the Greek is telling you, he wants you to be uncontaminated. Now that's an impossibility. Let me, let me help somebody here. He's using terminology that is, forward-leaning spiritually, that, that is goal-oriented spiritually, that uh, gives us something to walk and work towards in our life journey. He's not saying that you're going to, he's not saying that anybody's going to be ever going to be sinless or perfect on this side of the face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus <laughs> while you're in the flesh. Because we, 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 you know, we're transformed creatures, but we haven't reached that state of completeness until we are with Jesus to the day of the Lord, it says, till we see him. And we'll come back and rule and reign. We know how this story ends. The Bible tells us very powerfully and very plainly. You got something you can hope on. He says, be, be, be blameless and harmless. He's, show yourself that. In other words, try, do, the, do the very best with God's empowerment to live out the life where no one is pointing a finger at you constantly and saying, you know, man, you know, you're always getting in trouble. You're always in the wrong place. He said, try, try to be wise. Get, get the wisdom of God and apply it to your life journey. Be without blemish to the best of your ability. God will, God will bless into that. Because in verse 15, he's saying, you are amongst, now we're going to step outside of the church family. You do it individually. You model, you model it in your relationships in-house. And then you reflect it like shining lights out into the world. He said, because you're in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation, spiritually perverted and perverse, among whom you shine as bright lights, stars or beacons shining out clearly in the dark world. Ooh. Jesus has said, he is the light of the world. Jesus has said to him, us, we, his followers, that we are the small L lights in the world. And the Greek terminology gives, gives a sense that we are reflective. We are reflecting the light of Christ. Oh, wait a minute. I'm coming back to my key verse here, my opening verse. He has worked it in us. And now he's saying reflect it out from us. 
And when we do that, there's going to be a difference noted. Uh, the fruit of our spirit is going to be exemplified. We're going to, we, 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 we're going to see things dimly. Now, there, there, there are multiple levels of maturation as we continue our life journey walk. And so everybody's not at the same place, never will be. But wherever you are in your, in your spiritual walk of faith with Christ Jesus, he said, work that out and let God continue to, to mature you so that your vision, so that your interpretation of life and your application of the word in life will enable you to experience God's abundance and grace as you continue the journey. Watch out, I'm coming someplace now. So what God is saying that this world is dark, always has been, always will be until he comes back again. We see it. Not, wait a minute, we live in it. Paul was living in a, telling the church at Philippi, you are in a pagan society and you got all kinds of mess going on here. They're doing stuff in the church. They're having orgies in some of these churches out here and trying to claim that they're worshiping some goddess out there. They're trying to bring the mess of the world into the congregation of the church. And he says, we're not having that in here. Wait a minute, we're not having that in here. That's what Paul is saying. And you need to be examples of light in the midst of this darkness of the world. That sounds kind of extreme when you hear him talking about that in the setting that he's in. Until you kind of lift them pages, the interpretation of those pages from uh, whatever he wrote this, 50s, 60s A.D., and you begin to set the word of God, plant it right down here in 2020, and say, well, no, whoa, what kind of world are we living in today? Yeah, is, that, is this world still dark? Yes, it is. I mean, can I look out and can I cut on my TV and hear all kind of division and, and anxiety and all kinds of mess going on? Yes, you can. Is there a need for Jesus Christ in this scenario that, needs to, that will wash away the sins of the world and shine light into the world? Yes, he is. Who's going to tell them that good news? Paul says, work out that salvation that God has worked in you and model it in your, your body here and then live it out in the world. Mm. And he says and when you step into the world, he would tell the church at Rome, he would come back and write to the church at Rome. You know this very powerful chapter 12, opening, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, Sounds a whole lot like, oh, let that mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, by the transformation of your mind. In other words, you've got the word, he's giving you the word of God. And he holds on, he says in verse 16, holding out and offering up to all men the word of life. You start by sharing the word of life in a divisive decadent, dying, perverse, morally corrupt world system that we live in. We are here to be reflectors of the light of Christ. It's, it's, it's difficult to, test, to testify to somebody about how Jesus has made such a change in my life and then start sounding and looking exactly like they look, those who don't know Christ. Oh, y'all need me to finish up early, don't you? He says, there's purpose for our being here. There's purpose for our being here in this season. And a big part of that is to demonstrate uh, a Christ-centered type of lifestyle, a love that is willing to sacrifice itself for the betterment of those that it comes in contact with. Like, I mean, we're not going to the cross, but you can show sure enough love somebody enough to want the best for them in Christ Jesus, a humility that doesn't try to puff itself up but allows God to bring about the blessings and increase on it. A unity that is Christ-centered. Not uniformity, but a unity that is Christ-centered. We're all diverse parts. There's, 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 un there's the unity in our diversity. That's the way God has designed it. And it's a blessing. <laughs> it's a blessing. But, and it's Christ-centered. And an authentic and bold and grace-filled lifestyle and journey. In other words, you need to, we need to be living this thing out boldly and fearlessly. 
Because that's how we're going to model it in front of the world so that when you're sitting, I remember back thinking about in my old workforce days back in corporate America, when, 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 they, when they see me just bowing my head over my food, somebody would say, wait a minute now, that, bro- that, that brother must know something about Jesus. And he'd come on by. As soon as difficult times hit him, they swing by my office and say, can I talk to you, pastor, just for a little bit? I know, no, you're not my pastor, but I got this weight on me. I've got this, this heat, this, this burden on me. I've got this anxiety on my life. Can I just swing by for a few minutes before the day starts and, and share a little bit with you and have you pray with me? It's the kind of thing that you never know if somebody's watching, but when they see you, Reflecting the Christ-like light, they get, 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 get drawn to it. They get drawn to it. It's that, irres- that irresistible urging that comes only from the Holy Spirit on somebody's life. And then this Bible-centered type of approach. We need to, I'll try to say this quickly, we, we need to practice, we need to practice We need to practice uh, interpreting life with a similar modeling in the way we interpret our Bibles. This is where this is where, this is this is where theologian thinks about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you if you if we spend time with the Word of God and we look at what is God plainly saying and what is the context in which He's saying, what's the environment that's going on around it that's caused the, the Word to speak to this. And then you know, pulling ourselves on the scene. And then how do I see it and hear it like the, like the audience kind of hears it, hears it and sees it, the word of God coming to them. And then how do I begin to apply it? How do I take that and then bring it up to my situation today and say, now, Lord, what is that powerful word of truth and of life that you've given us through your word within the context, with this meaning? How do I apply that truth to my situation today as I'm looking at this world that is morally corrupt? This world is trying to kick Jesus out of everything that it can. This world that doesn't want to mention God if at all possible. And it's opponent, the world want to shut up the church, close down the church. You can open up all kinds of sinners, but you can't open up your church. You know, that kind of component. And all this, this world that thinks that somehow they can stop God from doing what he's going to do by trying to cut off, keep us isolated and insulated and staying in our homes and somehow we can't. And God says, well, I, wait a minute. You don't understand. I created this whole universe. I know what you're thinking before you even think it. You can't, you can't outthink God in the process. If you think you can shut down God's building, I'll just remind you that the church has always been greater than any building. I'll get my word out no matter how you try to stop me from getting my word out. I'll get my people living out this life no matter how you try to stop them from coming out their houses. You may try to inspect them with fear, but I'll wake them up and give them strength and wisdom in the midst of this thing. It's that kind of heart that it it says now interpret that life with a biblical perspective. Live our life from a biblical. So what does that mean? That means, well, what, what do you mean, preacher? What do you mean, preacher? Let me give you just a little bit. What that means to me is that when I see, when I get bombarded by all kinds of, all kinds of uh, uh, secular, humanistic, atheistic, agnostic philosophies, when I get all self-centered, self-focused, self-righteous type of thinking, when I'm bombarded by all this stuff from folk who stand up there on TV sets and try to tell me who's moral and who's not moral and all their lifestyle is as decadent as it can be, there's no Christ in their words, there's no unity in their message, and they're trying to tell me how to live. Oh, y'all gonna let me preach, aren't you? They're gonna tell me how to live out my life and who's good and who's not good and who's bad and who's not bad. When I get all that kind of messaging from folk who deny Christ and don't want nothing to do with Jesus, then my biblical interpretation is that you are not giving me truth. Because I, when I lay it down against God's word, it does not measure up. Not my standards, not my philosophy. Lay it against this right here and see how it measures out. That's what I'm telling you. That's all I'm telling you. And he says, hold out. The Greek term talks about holding it out in, like, hold two things. Hold it out in the midst of your difficulties, in the midst of your challenges, and then hold it forth in any future circumstance that you face. It's present and future. How do I do that? I can only do that by being empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk this journey of faith. And then Paul says, and what will happen is, I not only will rejoice 
and what God is doing in and through my life. But then I can rejoice in what God is doing in and through your lives. Huh? Because indeed, he's not calling us, me to be just one light. He's calling me to be a part of a reflective Christ-like light in a dark world that needs to see the light of Christ. For when it does, and those who respond, they too can be transformed. New creatures, saved, set apart, justified, guaranteed a home in glory. I might not know who they are, but someday we'll see each other, and we can rejoice together. And I love the way he says, let that mind be in you. I find myself having to come back to that. For being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every single name. That at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. If I were preaching that, I'd just say, you know, all, your, all these enemies, all this morally corrupt, every, every, every knee, every knee, good, bad, and indifferent, every single knee. You ain't, you're not bowing now? <laughs> you're going to bow. <laughs> every single knee will bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. Physical, spiritual, every knee. And every tongue shall confess. Are y'all getting this? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Work it out. It's been worked in. Work it out. Father God, I thank you for this time you blessed us with. Thank you for this moment of study, of proclamation, of faith, of praise, of worship. Thank you, Lord, for opening up your house and allowing us to come in without fear, knowing that you're able to do what only you can do in our lives and in our journey. Bless us, Lord. Continue to bless us. Bless us overwhelmingly that we might give you glory, that we might shine as lights for Christ in this world. We, we, we know it. We see it, Lord. We know what it looks like. But give us the, the boldness and the faith to step on out and let folk know that we believe in Jesus Christ, that we're the sons and daughters of the King Most High. And we're here to represent him and share the love of Jesus. Send across our path each and every one that you would have us share this good news with. And move on their hearts to receive it. It is to your glory and in the name of Christ that we pray at all, giving you thanks. Here. And as we walk out of this place together, prepare to go out into the marketplace of service. We, we thank you, Lord, and we say amen and amen. Before we close out our time together, we want to make sure that if you're here and we're without a church home, that you have an opportunity to become a member of Trinity giving your life to Christ or coming on your Christian experience or if you're watching us via the internet, if you've accepted him or you're looking for a church home and you're in our area, take a moment and just drop us a line and let us welcome you home. We'd love to have you as a part of our family. If you're here and the Lord's touched your heart, then feel free to come down front at the close of service and we'll welcome you here. If our hearts and minds are clear, Let's stand together as we prepare to close out with our benediction.
as we prepare to go into this next week. My prayer is that God will, con will continue to strengthen you in your faith. Strengthen you in your wisdom. Enlarge your heart for caring and sharing and service for him. Bless you in all areas of your being, whether they're physically or mentally, emotionally or spiritually. That he'll do for you what no one else can do. And that you will lean on him, that you will rely on and in him. And that you will walk hand in hand with Christ. Because there are, I contend there are some very special doors that he wants to open for you. Today and the days to come. And you can't get there unless you're walking with him. So trust him and walk with him. Praise him and rejoice in him. With our eyes with our eyes closed, our heads bowed, and our hearts humble before the living God as we lift our hands to him, assuming an attitude of prayer. Now unto him who is able to keep you and me from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let all God's people say amen and amen. Holy. As we lift our voices. Holy. 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 Lord God Almighty. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Blessed Trinity. God bless you and God keep you. Have a blessed day and a blessed week. Our offering trays in the back for you to, to share into as you leave. Join us Wednesday at the noon hour for devotional moments. Next Sunday, 11 Central Standard Time for our worship service. And each and every moment, receive our daily bread devotionals. God bless you and keep you today. <laughs>